Philippians chapter 4. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse number 10 and read through verse 13. And the King James text this afternoon reads, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Amen. In which state do you live? If you'll bow your heads with me another moment. Master, once again, Lord, we come before you in prayer. The Word of God has been open. The passage that you've laid on my heart for today, God, has been read. And Lord, once again, I acknowledge before you that I am not able to offer the people of God anything that would benefit them or bless them or help them. Outside of that divine anointing of the Holy Ghost, Lord, oh God, if anyone on this planet understands the need for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, this old preacher understands the need. I wouldn't dare try to preach without it. I need you, God, to quicken my mind. I need you to quicken my body. I need you to quicken my spirit today. Make the Word of God come alive in me that I might deliver a living Word to the people of God that their soul, their spirit, their life might benefit thereby. Touch not only the preacher, but touch as well those who, Today, who would hear the preacher? Touch the ears, more than this, the mind and the heart of every hearer, that we might be in a place, in a place today to be receptive to the divine word of God and let that word today, O oh God, perform miracles in our lives. Send your word to heal. Send your word to restore. Send your word to save. Send your word to deliver. Oh, Master, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. The Apostle Paul in this text that we read today is writing to the church at Philippi, and he tells the saints at Philippi, or the Philippians as they are called, that he is grateful that they have once again begun to minister to him. And he said, you know, it's not that you wouldn't have ministered to me at earlier times, he said, but the opportunity wasn't there for you. You know, I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I'm not stupid, I'm not foolish. I understand that there are a lot of people that watch our videos, a lot of people who participate in our church online, and many of you would love to support the work that we do, but you don't have opportunity. It just isn't there, and we understand that. 
But you know, Paul was letting the Philippian church know. He said, I'm grateful that once again, you're beginning to send some things my way that I'm in need of. Because now, once again, the opportunity has presented it, itself and you're able to do so. He said, but now I'm not writing this as one who's in a state of lack at the moment. He said, I'm not saying this as, you know, gee, I'm really struggling and I'm really suffering and it's nice that y'all have been able to start helping me again. He said, no, I'm not writing as one who's in a state of lack at the moment. But then he reveals something that he describes as a lesson he has learned or a truth that he has learned. And in verse number 11, he said, Not that I speak in respect to want, for I have learned. This isn't something that you just know and understand. This isn't just something that people get when they're born again or when they come into the church of the living God. This isn't something that believers just automatically have a clear knowledge of. No, this is something you have to learn. And it's an important lesson because in this knowledge we find happiness, in this knowledge, we find victory in our walk with God. In this knowledge, we find deliverance. In this knowledge that Paul is about to speak of, we find so many blessings. And without this knowledge, honey, there are things you're never going to get. You're never going to experience. You're never going to be able to lay hold of. What does Paul say he has learned? He said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, or I am, therewith to be content. Ooh. Well, I'm going to tell you, now, there's a lesson a lot of people need to learn. I grew up with grandparents on both sides of my family. My father's parents had 12 children. My mother's parents had 10. So I came from very large families on both sides. I literally had, growing up, 20 first aunts and uncles. Now, don't even try to count the cousins and all, and then get to the second cousins and all. It, it's just impossible to number. But I grew up around a large family, you know. And I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in southern New England. Southern New England is beautiful. It's mountainous. We have rivers that flow through valleys and uh, carve out these beautiful little areas where towns would set up their uh, downtown district, you know, right along the river on either side. And then up in the mountains, up in the hillsides is where you'd find all of your houses and where people live, you know. Uh, and I grew up up on a mountain. I grew up on a hill. And uh, it was about a mile from our house to the bottom of the hill that we lived on. And I used to ride my bike up and down that hill. I used to ride a skateboard, believe it or not. I loved skateboarding when I was young. When I had my paper out, I'd ride it down and carry it up. Because you sure enough weren't going to uh, ride the skateboard back up the hill. Riding your bike up that hill, I'm going to tell you, that gave me some powerful calves. To this day, I've got some pretty, pretty decent calves. That's from riding a bike up and down mountainsides growing up as a kid. Where I grew up in southern New England, we have four seasons. Four distinct seasons. You have summer, which is hot. And not as hot as Texas. The heat isn't as constant. <coughs> Excuse me, as it is here in Texas, we would have our heat waves. We'd have periods of time where the heat would be in the 90s, maybe the lower 90s on average. Um, 
for several days in a row. And much of the time, they'd be more like in the 80s, you know, maybe up to the high 80s. And, uh, but summertime was hot. Then it was followed by fall, and fall, it would cool down. And you knew that when fall came, it was time to pull out your duster, your light jacket. It was time to pull out your sweater vests and your sweaters because fall wasn't so cold that you needed to wear a parka or anything, but it was just starting to cool down, and it was distinctly different than it was in the summer. It was very different than the summer temperatures. And of course, all the foliage would turn colors. And oh my, you ain't never seen fall till you've been to New England and seen a New England fall. Honey, the trees, all the leaves on the trees are turning various colors. There are shades of red and shades of gold and shades of brown and shades of gray and uh, green. And oh my goodness, you know, evergreen trees scattered in there. And I mean, it is the most beautiful thing in the world. I, I didn't appreciate growing up as a kid like I do now. Isn't it funny when you grow up around something, you know, you just don't appreciate it like you do later in life. But it's gorgeous. It, it looks like a tapestry. It's so beautiful. Then winter comes. Oh boy, I'm going to tell you. Now winter up in New England is winter. We get ice. We get snow. We get sleep. There are many, many days you're driving on roads that have either ice or packed snow on them. Uh, they have trucks that come up and down the roads and plow the roads and lay down salt, you know. But there are often uh, patches that you'll hit where it's just a solid sheet of ice. you got to know how to drive in that kind of weather if you're going to live up there. I'm going to tell you right now. Your car starts going to slide. Anybody from the northeast knows you steer into the slide. You do not steer against the slide. You're never going to get control of your car if you steer against the slide. you got to steer into the slide. So whatever way that car starts to slide, you turn like you want to go that way. You say, yeah, but what if you're headed toward going off the road? You still have to steer into the slide. Once you do that, you'll actually find once the car is fully going in that direction, then you're going to be able to turn your wheel a little bit the other way, and it'll follow suit. It'll follow. It's like a horse. It'll follow your orders. But first, you have to regain control, and you do not regain control by going against the slide. you got to go with it. Winters are hard. I've had people say to me, I don't know how in the world you could, Tommy says this to me all the time, I don't know how in the world you could stand that cold. Oh, I can't stand the cold. I laugh at people down here in Texas. Winter comes and man, they start groaning and moaning. Temperatures drop to 60 and they're already crabbing about how cold it is, and I hate winter. I can't wait for winter to be over. And I grew up in an environment where we had four seasons. I'm going to tell you, I love winter. I do. I, and Tommy will tell you, I love winter. I don't have a problem one with winter. Doesn't bother me in the least, and it's not because down here it's so much more mild than it is in the Northeast, although that's true. But I love the change. You know, I, I don't like the monotony of constant heat and the sun constantly bearing down on you. Now, see, unlike people from Texas, I'm the exact opposite. You give me cold temperatures and cold weather, honey, I can get outside and work like a workhorse. You want to see me go up to our cabin in the woods in Oklahoma and get something done? You want to see me work myself to death and get some work done? Give me some cool temperatures. I'll go up there and work in the cold and be just as happy as a clam. I told Tommy years ago, I said, the key to the cold is simple. As long as you've got the right clothes, 
for the temperature you're dealing with, all is well with the world. It's that simple. Long as you got the right coat to wear, now, if it's 20 degrees, you don't want to be wearing a duster. You don't want to be wearing a light jacket. You want to be wearing a nice parka, you know, something a little more heavy duty. But if it's, say, up in the 40s, but well, you don't want to be wearing that parka. You want to be wearing something a little bit lighter than that, you know. And you might put a sweater on underneath it. Up home... We understand the concept of dressing in layers. And you'll notice that I'm, I'm living in Texas, but I still have a habit of wearing layers. I like, you know, that's how I grew up. That's the way I know. That's how you stay warm. You wear layers. I go up to Oklahoma to work on the property in the woods, you know. And Tommy will tell you, I actually have some flannel pajama bottoms that I wear under my pants. I use them as a layer. I, I put them on, then I pull my pants on over those. And let me tell you, I'm as snug as a bug in a rug. I'm so comfy, I can't stand it. I can go up there, and I've gone up there, I've spent the night a few nights in a row. It's been down in the 20s. I mean, cold as cold can get, and I'm just snug. Oh, Lord, do I feel good. I, you know, you can always warm up. I'll tell you what I have a hard time with is cooling down. You give me Texas, Oklahoma heat and sun, and that mess will cripple me. It'll lay me flat out, honey. It just wipes me out. It drains my battery. I cannot function in the heat. I can't stand the heat. Oh, my God, have mercy. I'll, I'll go up there to work, and I'm blessed if I can put in two hours or maybe three, and i got to quit and get into an air-conditioned environment and, and you know, take a shower, get cleaned up, and just hang out in the cool for a day. And I'll be, my body just be wrung out like an old rag. Because the heat to me is, is disabling. You know, it just lays you out. But I've had people who say, I don't know how somebody like you could stand living in a state where temperatures get so cold and winters get so hard. And I look at them and I say, well, you know, when you born there, raised there, grow up there, you don't think nothing of it. It's just what is. Yep, we get two feet of snow. It is what it is. You got to go out and you got to shovel the sidewalk. You got to shovel the driveway. I lived in New York City for 10 years. Now, I'll tell you, winters are tough on New Yorkers. Because when it snows heavy in New York City, the trucks come through to plow the roads, and all they do is bury your car, literally, on the side. If you're parked on the side of the street, just buries your car and five feet of snow, literally, and you got to take your car out, and you know, and it, I mean, living in New York's a whole different ball of wax, the city, that is. But when you grow up somewhere, you know, you approach things very different. I don't really remember a whole lot of people growing up who had nothing better to do than just stand around and gripe and complain and and whine about the snow or whine about the ice. No, I've heard people, I've known people who'd say, well, you know, I don't drive in the snow. When it gets like this, I just stay in the house. You know, if I know snow's coming, well, we run to the store, we get what we need, and we make sure we don't have to go anywhere for a couple of days. Again, you just adjust and, you know, you do what you've got to do to make it and to deal with the circumstances. People down here, I don't know how y'all can stand that snow. I sure hate to have to get out there and shovel that sidewalk and shovel that driveway and blah, blah, blah. And I say, yeah, but you know what? Up there, you don't have to go out and mow your lawn eight months out of the year either. Up there, you only have to mow your lawn if you're lucky about three or four months tops. Tops. 
Down here, you're mowing your lawn. Right now, I've got a lawn that needs to be mowed. We're, in the, we're right smack dab in the middle of winter, and I've got grass up to my knees that needs to be mowed. And every time it rains down here, I know within a day or two, I'm going to have to mow the lawn. You adjust. You do what you have to do in order to make it in order to survive, in order to get along in the state in which you were born. People born in the state of Texas, they do what they have to do. Some people hire folks to come and to mow their lawn because they don't want to have to go out and mow their lawn every two weeks. Well, i got news for you. Up in New England, a lot of people hire somebody to come shovel their driveway. They hire people, they don't want to go out and shovel, or they're too old, or, you know, they don't feel up to doing it. There's always young people in the neighborhood who are coming around with their big old snow shovel on their shoulder asking if you'd like them to shovel your driveway for you. And you can hire them just the same way we got people coming around here asking about, you know, mowing lawns, offering to mow your lawn. Our circumstances today do not need to determine the state in which we live. As children of God, we can live in contentment regardless of our state of existence. In whatever state our circumstances dictate, we must live our attitude and our deportment can make all the difference in the world as to whether or not we have victory over defeat, whether or not we have success over failure, whether or not we have joy over gloom. The state in which we live does not have to dictate the state of mind which we embrace. Paul learned the secret to victory and to success. He learned to walk in contentment regardless of the state that he occupied. Hello now. He said, I've learned what? I've learned to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. Whatever state I'm in. I've learned to be content. I've got news for you. I can be content in Connecticut. I can be content in New York. I can be content in Texas. Hello now. There are things about every one of those places that I love, and there are things about every one of those places that I hate. But I can be perfectly content in every one of those places. You know, we've got too many people in the church that remind me of some of my relatives. I've got certain relatives, and I'm telling you right now, honey, if they can't be un they cannot be happy unless they're unhappy. They cannot be happy unless they're miserable. Every time you talk to them, they've got something to gripe and groan and uh, miserate about. You know, oh, well, you know, my job and oh, my husband, oh, this and that. And they're constantly complaining about something. I think most of us probably have a relative somewhere along the line that's kind of like this. It, have you ever known somebody, maybe you worked with somebody, and they they just, you know, they could not be satisfied in their circumstance no matter what. It just seemed like it didn't matter if things were going good or things were going bad. They just weren't going to be content regardless. I'm going to tell you a little secret. There are too many people out there today who are griping and groaning. Listen to me now, folks. I don't care if you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. You listen to what this old preacher is about to tell you. There are too many people out there today who constantly gripe and groan about being single. And they constantly want to have somebody in their life. They constantly want to have a relationship. And yet, every relationship they've ever been in, all they do is gripe. 
every relationship they've ever been in, all they do is find fault. They find things that bother them and disturb them and cause them trouble. And they're constantly thinking in the back of their mind, oh, I could find somebody better than this, you know. And they go back into the market and they go back to shopping because they just cannot be content. Hello now. I want to tell you a little secret, honey. You better learn to be content somewhere along the line. Now, there are things when I was dating, there were things that were deal breakers for me and, and, that, and that there was just no way in the world I was going to put up with certain things. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm not going to put up with drunkenness. I'm not going to put up with uh, drug use. Those things are not going to work with me. That if I was dating somebody and all of a sudden I found out that they couldn't go a day without drinking themselves drunk or they relied on alcohol in order to get up in the morning and go to bed at night or they, you know, uh, were using drugs of some kind, that was it. That was the end of my dating experience with that person. And I've had a lot of people get mad as a hoarded at me. Because I would, those things I was not willing to put up with. I said, no, 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 honey. I told you from day one, that's a deal breaker for me. Those, those issues bring too much trouble and too much struggle and too much stress into not only a relationship but into your life. I don't need somebody stealing my VCR so they can pawn it so they can go buy drugs and all this foolishness. I don't need that kind of drama and that stress in my life. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have that. But I'm gonna tell you there was a point in my life where I actually realized, and it was actually while Tommy and I were together, and I actually realized that I was not allowing myself to be content in my relationship. I was not allowing I I was following a pattern that I had seen in my parents, in members of my family, my father, and I was constantly griping and complaining about something, and I remember the day I went to Tommy and I said, you know, I finally have come to realize something. You know, I, I, when it comes to relationships, I won't allow myself to just be content, you know. There are going to be things about every person you ever date, every person you're ever with. There are going to be things about them drive you up the bloody hill, drive you out of your mind. And try as you might, you ain't never going to change them. Did you hear that? You ain't never going to change them. But that's okay, if you've learned how to be content. I've seen marriages end, listen to me now, I, I know this sounds crazy, but I've heard people who have divorced complain that their spouse used too many towels every time they took a shower. Honey, if that's the biggest complaint you've got, you've got it good. You've got it awful good. Did their spouse cheat on them? Nope. Did their spouse come home drunk and beat them up? Nope. Did their spouse go out and drink up their paycheck? Nope. Did their spouse use drugs and, and uh, you know, create all kind of chaos in the family? Did their spouse abuse their children? No. No, but bless God, every time he took a shower, he had to have three towels. One around his waist, one over his shoulders, and one up around his head. And boy, I'm telling you, that makes for a lot. And he wouldn't use them towels again after one shower they went in the laundry. I was constantly cleaning towels. You have got to be kidding me. You know how many people wish that's the only problem they had? You know how many people wish they had a husband who was faithful, who was godly? This uh, person I'm thinking of, th their spouse was a godly, committed Christian man. You know, I mean, a, a good, good man. 
made good living, made good money, provided a beautiful home. They had children. The children were well cared for, and she was, the wife was well cared for. But oh no, all these towels he used. I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you don't learn what Paul is talking about in our text today, now you might think, Pastor, you preach some of the dumbest topics I've ever heard in my life. Why, why don't you get up there and preach prosperity like this preacher or that preacher? Why don't you get up there and preach me happy when it comes to this or that? I'll tell you why. Because it's not my job to preach you happy. It's my job to help you as a child of God live your best life and experience all that God has for you. And God has blessing. God has blessings for his people. He will cause you to walk in divine favor. But if you constantly find yourself in a circumstance where you just cannot be satisfied where you're at, I started talking earlier about my grandparents on both sides of my family. My father's parents had 12 children. My mother's parents had 10 children. My mother's parents were church-going people, and uh, they raised my mom in the Pentecostal church. And, of course, that's the church, same church I grew up in. And I will say one thing for my grandparents that I appreciate. And it's something that I learned. I've talked in the past about their belief in tithing and their practicing tithing and how that was a great lesson for me. I've talked about my grandfather being a very generous person and a very giving person, and that was a tremendous example for me growing up. But there's another area where they were a wonderful example. My grandparents did not sin in their home that they had owned for so many years, even though it had all kinds of stuff going wrong with it and there were all kinds of things that needed repair, it's kind of hard to keep your house up when you're raising ten children. There were things that could have been better. The condition of things could have been better. They, Grandma probably would have loved to have had wall-to-wall -wall carpet, but she didn't. She had hardwood floors. There were, they didn't have a real good heating system. A lot of nights in that old house, I mean to tell you, it got cold. It got chilly. Grandpa eventually built an a, a enclosed porch on the front of the house, and he put a nice uh, wood-burning stove out there. And he used to, with fans, he used to blow hot air into the house, you know. And that stove could heat the whole house. It did a good job heating the house. But it was still drafty. It could still be cold. They still used electric blankets in the winter time because no matter how hard you tried, you know, heat in the whole room just wasn't the easiest thing in the world to do. But one thing I'll say about my grandparents, they were content with their life. They were okay with their life. They were constantly looking and hoping and longing for something different. We live in a society today, especially those of us here in America, we've been taught by secular society that it's all about what you own, what you wear, what you drive, where you live, how big your house is. All these things are so important. And boy, I mean to tell you, people work themselves to death trying to have all the finest things that life has to offer. And they get something nice, and booby, they can't be satisfied with that. They want something nicer. They get something nicer, they can't be content with that. they got to get something yet even nicer. They get something even nicer, guess what? They still cannot be content. They've got to get something better than that even. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you one of the greatest blessings that will ever come into your life is learning to be content wherever you live at. Whatever your circumstance. Learning 
to be content. Now, contentment is not about, because there's a lot of people out there, and immediately they're going to say, oh, you're talking about compromising. You're talking about just giving up and, and not having any goals and not having any objectives and blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, I'm not. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. I'm talking about following the leading of the Lord, not following the leading of secular society. I'm talking about believing in a God who blesses his people. And if God blesses his people, I don't have to chase anything because all good gifts come from above. Sure does. Amen. That's what the Word of God says. All good gifts come from above, from the Father of lights. God wants to bless his children with a good life. God wants to bless his people with good things. But you know what? If you can't never find yourself in a content state where you're at, then God is not stupid. I'm not even stupid. And if I'm not dumb enough to believe that you'll ever be happy, regardless of what you get your hands on, certainly God knows you won't. Hello now. See, I believe God blesses. I can tell you right now, the house that Tommy and I live in right now, I, we're not in this house by any stretch of the imagination because I had any big dreams or any big goal or big objective of one day living in a house like this. Now, it's not a mansion, but I love it. We love it. It's nice. It's roomy. Not roomy enough for all my junk, but it, it, it's roomy. We got four bedrooms, we got two baths, we got two car garage, we got two living areas, formal dining. I mean, we, we love our house. Tommy can tell you, when this house came to us, it literally kind of fell in our lap. We didn't run after this. We didn't chase after it. We weren't doing everything in our power clawing to try to get this house. Matter of fact, when we made an offer on the house, we were offering the people almost $15,000 less than they were asking. And I told the real estate agent, I said, this is the budget I'm working with. And, and I want to tell you a little secret. The budget we were working with was not all we could afford. No, it just was what I had made up my mind that that's all we needed to spend. Too many people, well, if I can afford a $300,000 house, I'm going to buy a $300,000. Not me. Mm -mm. If I can afford a $300,000 house, but I can get a nice one in a nice area for $100,000, I'm just as happy to get that other one. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Why? Because I'm not trying to impress the Joneses. I'm not trying to keep up with the neighbors. I'm not trying to make my family think, boy, isn't he something special? Uh -uh. I'm content whatever state I'm in. I can be content a whole lot quicker, a whole lot easier than a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. My grandparents were that way. They were perfectly content with their little life. They were per And you know what? They never had bills. Their credit was pitch gold, perfect credit. They could go out and buy a new car any time they wanted to go buy a new car, literally. They could just go to the walk in the store, buy a new car like this. My grandparents used to make their mind up to buy a new car, you know, when they finally decided they wanted to trade in what they had and get something new. I mean, honey, they didn't have to sit and budget it or think about it for three minutes. They literally could just make the decision like this. Well, Don, what do you think? You think it's time for us to get a new car? Yeah, Eleanor, I believe it is. Well, let's go tomorrow and talk to the guy at Fitzpatrick's. Boom, just like that. Well, I'm going to tell you, but they could be content, Tommy. They could be perfectly satisfied where they were at. Did that prevent them from getting good things? And not, not by a stretch. You know why? Because God's real. You know why? Because God blesses his people. You see, if you think you've got to chase stuff, if you think in order to have something, you've got to claw your way to it, then obviously God is not a real big part of the picture in your life. 
If you think you've got to go out shopping for a boyfriend, for a husband, for a wife, and boy, I mean, you got to go out there in a state of desperation and just try to find you a man, try to find you a woman, and you and you got to fight and struggle with every relationship you ever have, then you don't believe God's real. You, you don't understand God the way I understand God. So I believe the Lord will send you somebody. If you believe God will send you somebody, then you don't feel so desperate and you don't make some bad decisions and bad choices. Can you begin to see now, can you understand a little bit why this preacher is talking about learning to be content, whatever state you live in? You see, your circumstances do not have to determine your attitude. When I first moved to, to Dallas, I got an apartment not too far from where Tommy was living. He was on a little road called Swiss Avenue. And I wound up getting a place, what, a couple blocks up the road, you know. Wasn't very far. I had a little two-bedroom apartment, had two baths, two-bedroom, two-bath apartment. Did, you, did I ever complain about my apartment? No, I loved my apartment. I haven't lived anywhere that I... And that I couldn't honestly say, I loved my apartment. There were things about it I didn't like. There were things about it I wasn't crazy about. If it wasn't for the fact I had a crazy neighbor lived under me who was constantly griping and complaining every time I banged a spoon on the side of a pot, literally, I, I'd have lived there forever. I was perfectly content to live in that apartment. I had no problems with that apartment. I've lived in a number of places. Everywhere I've lived, everywhere I've been, I've been perfectly satisfied to be where I'm at. If God wants to give me something better, He'll give me something better. Guess what? He did, He does. Hallelujah. But I didn't have to claw my way to get there. I didn't have to struggle. I didn't have to fight. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people, they want so many things that they wind up forfeiting half the things they want. Listen to me now, children. I know this is God today. They wind up forfeiting half the things they want as they pursue the other half of the things they want. Oh, they want a career like such and such. They want to make a certain amount of money. They want to have a certain kind of job. And they're so busy pursuing their career and pursuing their job that they lose their family, they lose their relationship. They lose their marriage. Haven't you ever seen that happen? Or you get people who want a house and they want the biggest house and the fanciest house in the best neighborhood that they can find it in because oh, it's all about impressing everybody. That's what motivates them. The worldly mindset, the carnal mindset of impressing people. And in the pursuit of that house, they lose their marriage. In the pursuit of that house, they lose their happy family. Their children wind up on drugs. Their children wind up with addiction issues. Why? Because mom and dad were so busy clawing and struggling to have that stupid house in that particular neighborhood so they could impress everybody that they forfeited their children. They forfeited their family. They forfeited their marriage. Am I telling the truth today? See, I know I am. I won't tell you, learning to be content is imperative to walking in Christian victory. The Apostle Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. You might say, well, yeah, but everything went good for Paul. Did it? In 2 Corinthians 11, 21 through 28, the Apostle Paul said, I speak as concerning reproach. As though we had been weak, how be it wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. 
Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, he says in parentheses. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. Paul went through all these things. There's not a one of us today who can even begin to compare our lives to the struggles and the troubles that Paul went through. And yet in all of this, Paul said, I have learned to be content. Oh my goodness. Paul, you must be out of your mind. No. No. You know, we got a bunch of people in America today call themselves Christians running around believing some of the most idiotic and asinine conspiracy theories that have ever been floated about other Americans too foolish to understand that somebody is feeding them a bunch of baloney in order to manipulate them and control them and that's all they're being is manipulated and controlled Tommy by these ridiculous stories and these ridiculous conspiracies but they're sitting here Believing all this stuff. And all oh, they think Fox News is keeping them abreast of stuff that no other news company, no other news station is telling them. Why don't you know Tucker Carlson and Rush Limbaugh and the like? Oh, they're telling us about stuff that these other liberal news people wouldn't even tell us about. Yeah, my question is... Um, all this stuff you know about that's so big and so important and makes such a difference in the world, well, what can you do about it? Not a thing. But I'll tell you what it does do. It creates all kinds of anxiety. It creates all kinds of fear. It creates all kinds of trouble in your spirit and in your life. Hello now. All it does is upset you. You see, how do I know what I'm talking about? I won't tell you how. Because I used to be one of those ding that listened to these people and believed half the garbage they talked till God woke me up one day and said, um, let me ask you a question. If all this stuff were true that these people are saying, he said, what can you do about it? What can you do about it? If Democrats are a bunch of child-eating, child-porn, you know, all this garbage, they, the most ridiculous, hideous, stupid stuff anybody could ever tell. Lord said, if all this stuff were true, what could you do about it? I said, well, Lord, you know, really, there's not anything I could do. He said, Exactly. So what you've got to do is you've got to go through life and you've got to simply have a certain amount of confidence and a certain amount of trust and a certain amount of belief that things are what they appear to be. Because believe in all kind of foolishness that tells you otherwise that you can't do anything about anyhow, what, what is that doing for you? Nothing. Nothing. It's doing nothing good for you whatsoever except making you miserable and making you unhappy. Paul said, I've learned to be content 
whatsoever state I'm in. I'm going to tell you, politically, I can be fine. I don't care if there's a Democrat in the White House or there's a Republican in the White House. It doesn't bother me no kind of way. Donald Trump was an exception because he was neither a Democrat or, an, or a Republican. He was a good old-fashioned demon from hell. He was a good old-fashioned despot, wannabe dictator. Yeah, I said it. He was an entirely different ball of wax. That's why I couldn't be silent about speaking out about him. But I'm going to tell you something. Normally, doesn't matter. <laughs> when George Bush was in office, junior, I was there for senior. When they were in office, when Ronald Reagan was in office, it, it didn't bother me no kind of way there was a Republican in office. And I know a lot of people run around just constantly raging and screaming and hollering. You know, whenever somebody is in office who's doing things contrary to the way they feel and they believe they ought to be done. See, policy doesn't bother me. Policy was not my issue with Donald Trump. Personality was. The man had a personality that made him uh, dangerous, to put in the way, literally dangerous to our democracy, dangerous to our republic. But as far as policy, you know, I can be all right regardless of who's in the White House. Am I telling the truth? You see... Because like Paul, I've learned to be content. Whether a storm is raging, whether I'm experiencing a shipwreck or an imprisonment, as Paul wrote of in 2 Corinthians 11, I have learned to be content. 1 Timothy 6, trying to close up today, 6 through 11. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Oh my goodness, now we got people today... They can't be content that they've got a roof over their head. They can't be content that they've got food in their mouth. They can't be content that they've got clothes to wear. I mean, and my God have mercy, a lot of folks have got a whole lot more than that. They've got a car in the driveway. They've got a job. They've got money to go to the movies. And they've got money to, you know, enjoy their life. And they still can't be content. Because they don't have what they think they ought to have. They don't have what is going to impress the neighbors or impress mom and dad or impress others. Hello now. Paul said, having food and raiment, let us there would be content. My goodness. If we learn to be content with the basics in life and just waited on God and let Him pour blessing our way. Let, and He will. He will. I've, I've lived it. I know what I'm talking about. And just let the Lord bless you. Godliness with contentment. If we would do what the Word of God tells us to do, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, but we want to do it a different way. We don't want to do it God's way. Because God's way requires that we put godliness first. God's way requires that we put righteousness first. God's way requires that we put the kingdom of God first. No, 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 no. We don't want to do it that way, Lord. We want to claw and we want to uh, dig and we want to do everything in our power to get what we think we should have. And we're never happy a moment in the process. And then when we finally lay our hands on it, we still cannot find contentment. Because there's still something. We look on the other side of the fence at the neighbor's yard and think, Oh, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Am I telling the truth today? But Paul told Timothy, For godliness with contentment is great gain. But then in verse 9 he said, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. 
For the love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. In which state do you live? Can you be satisfied? Can you be content in your present state? Can you be content in your present circumstance? Well, no, I can't be content because I'm single and I'd rather have somebody. Uh, got news for you. Until you learn to be content single, you're going to make all the wrong decisions when it comes to choosing that somebody. And you're going to find yourself saying, I'm going to tell you, they nothing help you make bad decisions any worse than desperation. There is nothing in this world that will uh, motivate you to make bad decisions worse than loneliness and despair. Am I telling the truth? See, so the best thing you can do for yourself is learn to be content by yourself. Learn to be content. You know, make use of friends. Make use of family. Make use of the fact that you can have any number of other types of relationships. Learn how to date rather than hook on to the first thing that walks across the room and looks at you through the corner of his or her eye. Learn how to date. Learn how to say thank you no when somebody reveals something about themselves that you know is, is not going to make for a positive and good relationship. You don't need that in your life. We got too many people, they don't date. No, they meet somebody today and they marry them tomorrow. They make a commitment to somebody they don't even know. That's desperation. You can't do that, folks. But if you learn to be content in whatever state you're presently in, it'll change your life, it'll change your world. You'll make better decisions. You'll make better choices. You'll learn to wait on God and let the Lord send blessing to you. Send positive things to you. And I'm going to tell you something, honey. When God sends it, it doesn't tax you. When God sends it, it does not uh, put a burden on you. Amen. That's right. When God sent us this house, when the Lord allowed us to have this house... We're paying less for a mortgage than we'd be paying for rent. So we got a whole lot more house for a whole lot less money than we'd be paying if we was out trying to live in a two or three bedroom apartment somewhere. Am I telling the truth? Yep. So the truth today is this. In which state do you live? Yeah, it gets cold, but you learn to live with it. Yeah, it gets hot, <laughs> but you learn to live with it. Those people who complain about me living up home and say, I don't know how you can live in that cold environment. <clears throat> running from a warm car to a warm house, running from a warm car to a warm building. I say, uh-huh. And y'all down here in the heat of the summer are running from a cold car to a cold building. Running from a cold car to a cold house. I mean, it's the same thing, different temperature. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? My question to you this afternoon is, in which state do you live? And can you find contentment in the state you're in? Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Mm -hmm.